Thank you. This is uh, going to be something completely different than biodiesel. Um, what we're looking at is uh, the impacts on everyday land use changes in terms of water supplies. And we didn't look at the water supply, we looked at the soil properties that uh, would um, impact people's uh, use of water. Uh, obviously, demand for water grows tremendously. Uh, back in the good old days, 1900, people used an average of 5 to 10 gallons per day of water. They could get it. Uh, by 2000, we're up to 10 times that, 100 gallons a day. And oddly enough, 36% of domestic water use goes to lawn and garden irrigation. And this irrigation is prompted by sprawl and suburbanization, uh, which is uh, something that happens. This is what the landscape looked like uh, after it was settled. Uh, this is a shot uh, not too far from here, from the airplane, but if you wait long enough, it's going to look like that. And so from this, where there's a lot of semi-natural soils, uh, no irrigation, everybody likes that green lawn, so they irrigate it a lot in suburbia, uh, keeping up with the Joneses, or whatever your next neighbor's name is. And so the question we were trying to answer is, does the way it's the way soils are managed when they re-contour the landscape when they build houses. Does that make an impact on water use demands for irrigation? Because about a third of all water is used for irrigation for that one study. Uh, so what's topsoil? Uh, I gave a talk earlier a few years ago about topsoil. One of those things that most people know is what it is. Like pornography, it's hard to define, but you know when you see it. Um, there's a lot of de definitions depending on your use of management issues and how you're trained. Uh, biologically, it's where all the goodies are. The microorganisms uh, uh, living in the surface two to eight inches or so. Um, we also talk about the fertility, rich humus, dark colors, and things like that. Um, it's from a farmer's point of view, it's what they plow. And uh, another general simple definition is the fertile of the soil for the Organically enriched A horizon, generally it's darker in color. And from a technical, pedological point of view, it's the other part of the soil. It's what we call an A horizon. And Illinois is blessed with the best topsoil in the world. Uh, here's an example of a natural soil that's been plowed for a long time and there's still um, on the order of two feet of topsoil in this particular shot. So this is what Illinois looked like after the prairie was taken away, but before houses came. This is what the prairie looks like after farms are taken away. Uh, houses are built. This is quite a different looking scene uh, from that thick, dark topsoil I showed you previously. Uh, where is the topsoil? Well, the topsoil generally is piled up in the back somewhere. Here's a lot number 106. A lot of rocks on the surface. Uh, one reason our topsoil is so good in Illinois is that the, the material is what we call lust, which is uh, silt sized material, no rocks. No rocks in this part are along the surface because, for the most part, because we have wind blowing dust. And so anytime you see lots of rocks like this on the surface, someone scraped away the good stuff or you're in an unusual circumstance. Where's the house of topsoil leaf? Well, paper pans can come by on some big developments and scrape all the topsoil off, pile it up in the back. Sometimes it gets reprocessed and sold back to the landowner. Anytime you move topsoil, though, you have a problem of compaction and mixing with subsurface materials. So we wanted to see, if we looked at the way soils are on developed areas compared to undeveloped areas, how much will water infiltrate, what the, hyd the hydrology of the soil is from a shallow point of view. Another view uh, showing you how rich these stockpile topsoil is volunteering is coming in the development near the plain field in Illinois. Close up of what uh, one person lawn looks like uh, here in Champaign County. That's my foot there for scale. Uh, a lot of sand and gravel on the surface, and a little weed struggling to grow there. Uh, and what you do, you put down on top of this really messed up soil, uh, beautiful looking uh, sock. So, what's the impact? Um, it's about an inch of reasonably good soil that puts it far from some area where they're growing saw and put on top of this what used to be some of the best soil in the world, which ends up not too good because what's on top of the soil generally, uh, after they finish building a house, is what was in the basement. 
down below the subsoil. That ends up on the top. And so that's some material probably down five, six, seven feet below the surface. So what do we do on this project? Well, of course, we have to decide where to go. We want to look at some current practices. Uh, so we picked uh, some fairly uh, recently developed sites, uh, both in Champaign County and up near Plainfield. If anybody wants to uh, invest in wall and uh, wall green stock, there's a, like uh, they're popping up like mushrooms in, uh, in the county. They're amazing. Anyway, uh, so we, we uh, went out to these sites and we took uh, soil samples, we treated them with soil cores, uh, done by hand, no machinery involved. We also looked at soil bulk density because compaction is a big issue. Anytime you move soil with heavy machinery, compaction is an issue, and plant roots don't penetrate compact the soil very well. We also looked at infiltration, which is the rate at which water goes into the soil. We use a device called an infiltrometer for that. And we also looked at the penetrometer resistance, which is a device, a penetrometer device to push a metal rod into the ground and see how it, uh, it limits the root penetration into the soil. How well the uh, soil was fluffed up after it was uh, regraded. And then we looked at uh, soil fertility with extractable elements to see if we make sure that we weren't really looking at problems of growing grass on turf areas because of fertility issues as opposed to physical issues. We were mostly concentrating on physical problems. All right, here's our sites uh, near Plainfield, uh, Chicago kind of Collar County situation. We looked at 12 recently constructed schools. Uh, we had, anytime you work like this, getting access is a problem. Yeah. What's a penetometer? Kind of trauma? Yeah. It's a, it's a load cell okay. uh, and a distance sensing sonar uh, mounted on a rod that you push into the soil. And so it measures the rate at which you push the rod into the soil and the load on the load cell on a steel rod. Uh, it didn't work too well because the compaction was so bad. Um, we'll talk about that. That's a kind of trauma. Uh, we also, okay, so we looked at uh, near and away from the buildings, figure little kids coming out of school, running around, compact the soil, maybe near the school, and walk a little bit further away. So we had two sites for school. Then we had two reference farm fields. Uh, jokingly, I'll say there's 10,000 years old because the schools were one to eight years old. You had a very rapid, like, rapidly urbanizing area, so urbanizing area. Total 126 samples there. Champaign, we looked at residential sites between 15 years old. We looked at the front and backyards, thinking that the front yards were better managed, the curb appeal in the backyards. And we looked at three wraps per site. We looked at one commercial site not too far from near uh, Research Park, they are right there. Um, that's just to say sub sites, not sun sites. Uh, and how Paris jump out at you. <laughs> looked at this slide a lot of times, never saw it say the sun. Anyway, uh, then we looked at three reference farm fields, about 12,000 years old in comparison. The farms aren't that old, but the soils are. And again, we looked at around 69 samples. Um, here's a uh, one of the things you can do now, the web is everywhere and it's wonderful. This is uh, the Osable Middle School. This is a soil map off the web soil survey. You can see the polygon lines here showing where the soils were before they built the school. That's the school that built after the soil map was made. And we sampled near the school here and further away from the school there. That's the sample of site one and two. And we can see what the soils were ahead of time before they were mapped. The uh, soil mapping unit there is uh, uh, 223C2, which is a Velma silt loam. And uh, the NRCS has tables of data saying what the infiltration should be, what the bulk density should be, and things like that for these individual soils. So we compare both to reference sites and to what's published on these soils. And there's a uh, one of my assistants, John Marlin, out there directing traffic, probably doing three things at once, talking on the phone, telling me what to do, and standing it out, uh, outstanding in the field at that site. Another site, this is the Eagle Point Elementary School, again, a brand new school, 
Uh, houses are built right up to the edge of a farmer's field here. Uh, there we took these the two reference sites there. Again, you can see the soil map. You can relate what's on the, what was there before they built the school to what we found. So we have five sites, five and six, and 13 and 14. This is a farmer's field. This is still a farmer's field. And uh, you can see the roads just end way for this to be developed right here. Um, and there's the soil mapping units there. Elliot Silk Home is a common one in that part of the world. And so that was a, that, we could go to the reference tables to see what they, uh, what the prop that soil was before development. And here is one of my students standing out at that very site. There's the farmer's field surrounded by brand new development. So this is managed by the school district, and this is owned by a private farm. We sample here and there to see what the difference was. In Champaign County, um, these are the soil maps. That house there was selected. Um, we looked at the front and backyard there. Again, this is on a soil map basis, so we can see which soil was there before the housing development land. This is what that site looks like. We had to call Julie, of course. This is one of the big problems working in residential areas. Every once in a while, a soil scientist will poke a hole in the ground and hit a pipeline or a, or a water line or a worst case scenario, electric line. So you have to get Julie to come out. This is a big pain at all these sites because getting permission to go there and then getting Julie to show up and all that stuff. But even though we were only going down, uh, most of our sampling was very shallow. Uh, I've seen them install cables and things uh, just on top of the subsoil with just nothing but sod on top. So there's an inch of soil between the surface and a cable or something, which is not a great idea. Uh, some of the sites were so new they didn't have, they were under construction at the uh, time of after May, and the houses are coming in there, there are houses there now, uh, such as this. These are some of the infiltrometers. I'll show you a closer picture of these. They are uh, the mice that um, you Add water to the soil, let it soak for a while, add more water, and see how quickly the water enters into the soil. That's an infiltration test. And the idea being, if it rains on the soil, you want the water to go in, not to run off. And if soils are compacted, if they have bad infiltration, when people irrigate, buy city water, and they're going to waste some of that, it's going to run off, because it's not going to go on the ground if they don't have good infiltration. So this involved uh, adding water to these uh, infiltrometers. We did three per site to get uh, replication because one of the problems with any measurement like this is there's a huge variance between sample and sample. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. This is our commercial site. Again, not too far from here from the data on the uh, research part. And the developer put extra amount of topsoil down. I think John twisted his arm or something. <laughs> Uh, but one of the problems, anytime again you move topsoil, you see these tracks. You got to drive equipment on it, and uh, most people don't catch on to the fact that you really shouldn't drive heavy equipment on soil that's going to be used to grow anything because you get compaction. Most engineers and things want want compaction because you don't want things to move, like the foundations, the sidewalks, the roads, and things like that. But you want soil that's going to have plants on it, not to compact. Convenient to drive trucks and things on it. And again, they like it nice and smooth. So they put a lot of effort and a lot of weight on the soil. Here's how much topsoil they put down. There's the subsoil. That's me. Um, that's uh, Juan. He's there. Uh, he's the, the contractor, I guess, working for the, the builder. But you can see they put a, a lot of topsoil down there. But uh, this is a typical thing. This is as designed. This is as built. Topsoil like this. It's a little joke. Uh, there's our infiltrometers um, going to town there. Uh, and again, we monitor how quickly the water drops inside the infiltrometer. That's interpreted as being the infiltration rate. And another view of our infiltrometers one set there, one set down there. Again, filling up the infiltrometers with water is a big part of it because uh, you get to 
tremendous variability. Sometimes uh, there's almost no water infiltration, other times it just disappears. And so this is what we did after a 15 minute freeze cycle. Here's the uh, soils. This is probably uh, kind of glaze over a little bit here. But these are the soils series now. If you're not into the business of soils, uh, we should know that soils have common names and scientific names like organisms do. Common names that we call the soil series here. For instance, gray mock silt loam is a moderately well drained soil that is mapped by mapping it by 4180 at site one. And here's a scientific name to find silty mix, super active, mesic, toxic active parts, you golf. We try to, we want to be taken seriously like the organic chemists when we come up with big words to take us more seriously. And these are the series, the soils that were there beforehand at uh, Plainfield, and you can see most of them are uh, not well drained. This tells you that the landscape position is fairly low, the infiltration rates are going to be kind of slow, and they're not uh, soils that you expect great rates of infiltration, and also they're susceptible to compaction because of the high in Champagne, here's the Champagne sites. Again, you'll see a lot of what we call tipidendal atolls. This is the dark colored soil that's common in the Illinois prairie soil. And fully drained is common uh, to a lot of these soils. Drummer is the most common soil in Champaign County. In fact, that is the state soil. You may not know that Illinois has a state soil, but that's it. It's the drummer. Drummer Silky Clay Loam. The official site for Drummer Silky Clay Loam is not the department on the South Farm, University of South Farm. Again, uh, these tend to be kind of wet soils in this area. And so that's a problem, potential problem with compaction and infiltration. This is a simplified table of all the plain field soils pre-development. Uh, here we have set the soil map unit name, uh, as you can see it in on the map, and then the name, common name of drummer, Andrews El Paso. This is this column is the available water in the soil, inches per inch, so the volume of water content. And these are all very high. About 20% of the volume of these soils can be what we call plant available water. The water has to get in the soil first, has to infiltrate. And that's what we're going to measure. The bulk densities run, uh, bulk density is the way you're going to volume the soil. And you're looking for an ideal bulk density, it's about 1.2. So if you get above that, you're starting to look at compaction. So the bulk densities are always pretty good range, pretty near 1.2, 1.3. KSAT is the grade which water goes into the soil, inches of water per hour. And you can see it's quite a range here, anywhere from about half an inch to two inches of, of water per hour will enter the soil. So this is one of the things you're dealing with, fairly wide um, variance in the KSAT. <coughs> Hydraulic conductivity infiltration. Now, I'll put a few other things up here. The pH is the uh, chemist from the body, so everybody knows that. These are very often optimal pH, they're neutral. CEC, the cation exchange capacity of these soils, also very good. This is the ability of the soil to hold, hold cations to measure potential soil fertility. And then we have the soil organic matter percent. And again, these are really high. Uh, most places in the world with uh, diet have soils, these nice uh, <coughs> soil organic matters here on the order of three to five percent, which is much, much higher than much of the world. And then uh, the NRCS will in their tables will tell you the problems that you were going to use this material for lawns. And there are problems. Uh, very limited because it ponds, in other words, water doesn't infiltrate into the drummer. Um, there's Andrews is also kind of wet. The saturated zone is fairly close. The pond is an issue with El Paso. Graymont is one of the better ones that is not limited. So that would be a good soil to develop from a tough soil point of view. Likewise, Champagne, we have problems. Limitations are ponding the drummer because it's a wet soil. And planting is very wet and peat is very wet. Again, look at very high organic matter contents, high pHs, but KSAT's in the same range, 0.6 to 2. And bulk density is a little higher. 1.5, 1.4. These are getting a little bit higher, which is quite possible. 
but high male moisture oil capacity, 20% or more, because of the particle size of the bus. And if you look at the standard, NRCS standard infiltration rates, remember we were 0.2 to, uh, let's see, what do we have up there? Uh, KSAT 0.6 to 2. So they run all the way from low to, to, to high. Low ends and what we're trying to avoid. We would rather have fairly high infiltration rates because, again, the more water you, and the higher rate of water you add to the soil, you want it to go in the soil, not run off and run down down the street into the sewer. Uh, there's John again showing one of our sites. Our experimental design is we spray painted um, a, uh, was it 10, 10 meters, 10 feet, not 10 feet, a plot. We made several of these little plots. And uh, we did not, we did, purposely did not pick areas that looked bad. We picked areas that were typical. And within these plots, we did all of our tests. Now, one of the things we tested with, of course, was the soil pouring devices that can push this in the ground. And you can see, uh, as opposed to the two feet of topsoil, which we might get up there, here we've got 10 centimeter of uh, topsoil and uh, probably contact, pump contact there into subsoil material that had been backfilled. And so one of the things you got going is that the crop only has that much topsoil to work with. One of the advantages is, though, from a turf point of view, that they're fairly shallow and rooted, so they don't need all that. You're going to mow it anyway. Here's the penetrometer resistance test. This is depth in centimeters. And this is the uh, penetrometer resistance of megapascals. And you can see that contact where most of the driving was done when we were backfilling, down around 15 centimeters or so, you get a, a high there. This material has been either left alone naturally or dumped in a big fill. And most of the activities near the surface, but if you try to remove compaction, most compaction removal activities are only in the upper 10 centimeters or so. Action can easily go down to 20, but they typically don't try to mitigate that shallow. So one of the problems we had with doing uh, penetrometer is very often we hit rocks like this. There's some concrete in there, building debris. Uh, so this is another core. There's a little topsoil they added, and then this is subsoil that they put down. Another core there where you can see uh, added topsoil rocks and debris, and then there's a buried surface soil there, so different layers, and it made it difficult to use a penetrometer because of all the rocks. In the natural fields, to take the samples, we used again this hand pouring device, uh, pounded in by a strong undergraduate student there, and again, right on the edge of a development. Here's some typical cores, soil cores from the playing field sites, uh, 10 centimeters or so, reasonable topsoil there and subsoil below that. Here it's down to around 20 centimeters and there's some building rubble there. Here again about 20 centimeters of nice soil, down around 18 centimeters of topsoil replaced. Uh, here's uh, the topsoil looks like it goes down to about 22 centimeters. So it's quite variable. That's one of the problems. Anytime you have humans moving soils, results are quite variable. Uh, from champagne, uh, sometimes I think I'm looking, chasing after my dog when I do this kind of stuff. Uh, my kind of that thing when it's a dog. <clears throat> anyway, you see very thin topsoil, not that big, uh, two feet like we expect. And compacted material of any, any kind down there, there's some concrete uh, or gypsum there. So from a particle size point of view, particle size is the percent sand, silt, clay, and soils. And the clay field sites are all silty clay, silty clay levels kind of tight up in there. The natural soils are actually down here, these last three. Uh, champagne sites are a little more scattered, but again, commonly silty clay loams and silt loams. Uh, I was surprised our data didn't show a lot more sand uh, because of the that one picture I showed you all the sand and gravel on the surface, that's just on a thin layer on the surface when you take the upper 15 centimeters that kind of average that. From a um, soil chemistry point of view, we're on a busy table, but here's the, uh, the research sites here and the reference sites here. The take-home message from this is that 
generally the reference sites uh, have little less uh, fertility than the uh, fields around the farm, around the uh, schools. The school district in Plainfield's got a fair amount of money that they spend a lot of it on fertilizer for the soils. And so you can see that uh, phosphorus, for instance, is pretty high in all the schools and districts and uh, potassium is not too. Likewise, uh, Champaign, um, the two commercial sites tend to have a lot more soil, typical soil uh, nutrients that you worry about, phosphorus and potassium. Again, I think the folks here uh, put a little more money down on the, on the field. Bulk density, uh, we talk with this device called bulk density sample, is a, a seven and a half centimeter deep sampler which is driven into the ground, and then we cut the ends off. We try to take a bulk density sample, samples close to the infiltrometers, because these had to be left running unattended for at least half an hour. And we did other projects on there. And the bulk density sampler is, uh, you take a known volume of soil, so you trim the bottom off, you trim the top off, and you, uh, you notice the dimensions, and you can calculate the mass and the unit volume. So if you look at the bulk densities of the plain field sites, um, much better than I thought. They're rarely over 1.4, and the reference sites come in around 1.3. So this is the bulk densities for all of the surface soils on all of the schools we looked at, and surprisingly, reasonably good. We look at the volumetric water content because this is some measure of the health of the soil. This is a very transitory thing, though. If we did do all the samples at the same time, you can't make too many uh, assumptions about the results. But typically, because um, uh, turf grass is growing all the time, it has a fairly high demand on water. And so you can see that some of these schools are rather dry. Uh, the soils are rather dry. Volumetric moisture content are around 15 to 20%. Uh, other ones a little higher. Again, this may be a reflection more of antecedent moisture to rainfall, things like that. But they're not out of line with the reference sites. And the variability is a real killer, though, in terms of doing statistics on this. This is a box plot diagram of the bulk densities from all the schools in the playing field and the reference sites. And these are statistically indistinguishable mainly because of the real variability in bulk density from the uh, manufactured sites. The reference site, of course, is semi-natural, having only been plowed and not been manipulated to the extent that the you know, school sites were. Likewise, bulk density from the Champagne sites, this is the commercial area, a little higher, and probably because they did a really good job getting that soil back throw the truck back and forth on it. And the lawns all over the place in terms of variability in the preference sites is much tighter group. Again, not statistically distinguishable. But it does say that there are some that are very bad. Um, here's the infiltrometer going in. Um, this device is pushed into the ground about two inches, and then this, this reservoir is filled with water as a float with a uh, scale on to see how fast it goes. Here it is in the cornfield. We uh, there's a timer there. We have a start timer and float uh, gauge so we know how quickly the water drops. And here, here it is in one of the uh, schools in Plainfield. Again, we put uh, multiple sets of that in order to cut down variability, but uh, variability is still uh, overwhelming. Uh, oddly enough, we had one way out of whack in the uh, reference site up here. Again, the schools are fairly tight on this scale because of that one so on, but we couldn't really separate the two statistically. <coughs> and Champaign, uh, same deal, although the big ranges of uh, infiltration were in the lawns up to uh, very high and very, very low. Some that were essentially concrete. The commercial site, we have fewer arrests, so was also very low infiltration. And how to deal with variability in infiltration, there's a lot of arguments in the literature. I just plotted out here the uh, various ways to look at arithmetic mean versus uh, the alternative means. And, uh, 
for looking at uh, looking at the filtration data because it is so variable. And so I, we looked at the duo mean, the uh, harmonic mean, the uh, trim mean, and the median. And you can see you get one curve uh, depending on uh, which you get different relationships quite differently depending on which mean you get because the variability is so great. So we went mostly with the median, which is the X is on here with the one oddball. Again, we took our bulk density samples very close to the penetrometer, to the hydrometer, and it would be intuitive to think that if you have a highly compacted soil, water wouldn't go into it, right? That's a common sensible thing. But here's the relationship between infiltration rate and bulk density. It's not, it's a, truly a scatter diagram. You couldn't draw a line there if you wanted to. The infiltration rates from 0 to 12, and bulk density is from 1.1 to 1.6, think that a higher bulk density would be lower infiltration rates, but that didn't work for the plain field sites at all. And it didn't work for the champagne sites as well. Big surprise. And I even trimmed off one of its way out here at like 36 or so. Uh, there is surprisingly no relationship between bulk density and infiltration, although intuitively there ought to be. So take no message from this. Uh, Illinois is some of the best soils in the world for agriculture. Illinois is rapidly suburbanizing state, all that's closed down, slowed down a little bit with uh, financial issues, but uh, this may pick up again. I, I was talking to a developer around, uh, in, around Chicago, he said there's big areas that have uh, roads out in the little farm fields that uh, we thought was planted out to be developed uh, a few years ago, and now they're just concrete paths of nowhere. The farmers have leased the land back and they're plowing in between the, the highways and things that are out there. That'll be developed probably one of these days. Water resources are limited, particularly in the collar counties. There's a lot of concerns about what's going to happen in Lake Michigan, uh, drawdowns from Lake Michigan. That's one of the things that uh, precipitated this study. Um, and there's just a proposal to re-reverse the flow of uh, rivers into or out of uh, Lake Michigan, which will be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, soils are impacted by development. Uh, lawns are not maybe as good as farm fields or natural prairie, but pavement is forever. So, um, that's one of the things that uh, people who look at developed areas often worry about the hydrologic curves being uh, accentuated by all the runoff. It's mostly from the paved areas, not from the, from the yards as much. Water is not infiltrated, it's not available for plants, and runs off in fast rate of flooding. That's uh, very intuitive. So, this is a big surprise. So, bulk density infiltration rates are highly variable on disturbed soils, and I couldn't find any kind of correlation despite all those numbers. And statistically, I could not support. The hypothesis that infiltration is negatively impacted by development compared to the rates on natural soils that we measured and those on published values, they're within uh, all part. So we really couldn't, um, you can't make the case that development is always a bad thing from irrigation and water demand, but we try. Yeah, it's because, ironically, the, sometimes the better job you try to do, the worse uh, you're going to end up with. The analog, I work with mine reclamation and the SMAC, which is the Surface Mine Control Reclamation Act, required the miners to put back uh, 48 inches of soil material, 48 inches, and all the original topsoil. And they did it, by golly, with big machines, they're going to do it right. And that made the situation worse. Because where they, what they found out is where they didn't do that, they didn't reclaim soil, but they just threw it really nearly anywhere. Things grew like crazy because the soil was loose and really lovely. And uh, oddly enough, 1977, SMAC was written, and they recognized bulk density as a problem. And the, since 1977, the USDA has not come up with a standard for bulk density, given they were supposed to be in 77. They recognize that as a problem. So, any other questions? Yeah, you mentioned in the, the song, you did a song for JP analysis. Right. So uh, you use their um, analyzing textbook and analysis. Yeah. So my question is in the general, how to drive which song is a high return? Which is a low, is a low, you know? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. question. Yeah. What, what is an appropriate amount of nutrients as measured with these techniques? Yes. Um, generally, uh, higher is better for some of them. Uh, people tend to over-fertilize their yards, and they don't 
lot of uh, what else you're going to do on Saturdays. You put a lot of fertilizer out. Uh, the one measurement I did make with nitrogen, and uh, nitrogen is the most important nutrient in growing crops, but it's a very difficult thing to measure uh, and predict. Uh, there, there are standards for uh, fertilizing turf grass areas. My, what I wanted to do was eliminate any problems that, when I'm comparing two soils from a physical point of view, I'm really looking at a chemical problem. And, I'm really, and that, my analysis ruled that out. So there are, there are standards, either in the, our department, actually, that's crop sciences, has a list of what you would consider normal ranges of extractable elements. But I didn't find, like, I also looked at zinc and other potentially toxic things. Copper. I think if you're a building, would be really high. Yeah, you can see it. Uh, 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 I don't know, I so <coughs> the radiation should be turned the nutrition and the uh, humidity. I only looked at the surface soil, the only six inches, because I'm looking at the rate at which water is going to enter the soil. Now, that permeability is the rate at which water goes through soil, infiltration is the rate at which water enters soil. Those are both problems. Limiting how much water can be put on a soil, and, and then it's you got uh, deeper issues, and uh, I didn't have equipment at the time. So it seems to me that both uh, actually and Kelly Clark media should be gone from the Picasso stall. Uh, shallow soils are not going to be precious on the trees. What's that? Shallow soils are going to be precious on yeah. Yeah, that's one that's one of the reason you have such high variability if you hit a crack you know, the water just runs right in, or if you hit you got a rock underneath there and you don't know it. So the variability and filtration is huge. Particularly I use fairly small samplers. A lot of people think we should have a huge trauma. So that's a lot of water. Sure, did you have a question I'm not going to answer this correctly, but uh, the reference soils, most of the soils that are listed, some of them said they're not suitable for certain purposes like table pond. Right. Now, if Illinois, the soil is generally concerned, it, it, it looks like most of the soils that are listed had pond issues. Right. So, by the very nature, the reference itself is not a highly percolating soil, if I understand it correctly. Right. So, would, is that the reason why you're not really seeing the negative impact of the Yeah, that's part of the reason. Part of those tables are the soil as found in nature, and you know, of course developers will recontour the landscape to get the water runoff, and then they put in subsurface drains to get the water off. So ponding is, is both a soil issue and a landscape landform issue. And the builders can't change the soil very much except by making a burst. The landscape, they'll put in berms and, and uh, sewers and uh, try to make the place look more rolling. But you know, anybody who has a basement around here knows about water. Uh, where I come from, everybody has a basement, and I didn't know what a sump pump was until I moved to different soils. <laughs>